Hello, this is Physics Standard Level Paper 2, May 2011, Time Zone 1. First, the data analysis question. Here's a graph, and we need to interpret the relationship from this graph. So the first question asks for a piece of evidence that D is not proportional to N. And the second question asks us to draw the line of best fit. So let's do those together. Now, if the two quantities were proportional, we would be able to draw a straight line that fit all of the error bars and pass through the origin. We can attempt to do that, but you can see we can barely draw a straight line. In fact, we can't actually draw a straight line that fits all of the error bars. This straight line just misses one, two, three, four error bars. So that suggests that not only are they not proportional, they're not even linear. Now, since the straight line doesn't fit the data points, we need to draw a curve. So our answer needs to be a smooth curve that fits as close to, as possible to all of the data points and certainly passes through all of the error bars. Now, it might take several practices with a pencil to get this right, but just by hovering your pencil above the paper, moving backwards and forwards a few times, you can get a feel for what the path should look like. And then in one quick, quick stroke, it takes a few tries, you can almost get there. And that will do for a, an attempt on a graphics tablet. The point here is it's a curve and it does pass through all of the error bars. And to answer the first point, the evidence that shows D is not proportional to N, well, you could either say that the line of best fit is not straight or, or it's not possible to draw a, a line that passes through all the error bars, or alternatively, there's, there's no line that passes through the error bars and through the origin. On the next page, now we have the graph of d squared against n. And we want to calculate the percentage uncertainty in d squared of the seventh ring. So the seventh ring is this one. And we need to find the percentage uncertainty in d squared. So first we need to find the percentage uncertainty in d, which we can find from the graph on page 2. So back to page 2, ring number 7. We can see that the uncertainty here is 2 squares. That is 1 square plus 2 half squares. And on this graph, one square represents five squares. Five squares represent 0 0.2, so one square must represent 0 0.04. So two squares will represent 0 0.08 centimeters. And the value of d at n equals 7 is 1.26. So the percentage uncertainty will be 0 0.08 divided by 1.26 times 100. And the calculator will tell you that is 6.3%. And let's leave that to two significant figures as we're not yet at a final answer. So the uncertainty in D is 6.3%. Therefore, the uncertainty in D squared must be 2 times 6.3% or 12%.
And one piece of evidence that supports the relationship d squared equals kn. Well, if we go back to look at the graph, what can we see? Firstly, it's a straight line, and secondly, it passes through the origin. So either of those should be uh, an acceptable answer to the question. But looking at the mark scheme, actually they're looking for us to say it's possible to draw a straight line that passes through the origin, and the fact that it passes through the origin is necessary to get the mark. Now, to determine the value of k from the graph. Well, the graph is of d squared against n, and the equation that fits this curve is d squared equals kn. So the gradient of the graph is simply k, because if d squared equals kn, then k is equal to d squared over n. And the gradient of the graph is, is, is d squared over n. So, to find the gradient, we should choose a triangle as large as possible, and a sensible triangle, we'll start at the first point here, draw a horizontal line, and starting at the top of the triangle here. So that's the triangle that we'll use to determine our gradient, and it's important to show this on the graph, because that's one thing the examiner is always looking for. So the gradient is going to be delta y over delta x. Delta y goes from 0 0.25 0 0.25 up to this point here. I shouldn't have done such a thick line because we can't see it very clearly. That's 2.8. I'm going to write that down on the next page. That's the change in y. Divided by change in x. So the change in x is from 1 to 12. So divided by 12 minus 1. And that gives a value for k of 0 0.23. And we should give a unit to k. Now the unit for the y-axis is centimeter squared, and the x-axis has no unit. So the unit for the gradient will be simply centimeter squared. Now to find the uncertainty, we need to look at how the gradient can vary. So we need to draw two more lines one is a little thinner and in a different colour so we can see them clearly. So we can draw a line of maximum gradient for the, from the bottom of the first error bar up to the top of the last error bar. And we can draw a line of minimum uncertainty from the top of the first error bar to the bottom of the last error bar. And again we need to calculate the uncertainties in these two lines. So the maximum uncertainty here goes from 0 0.15 up to 3.05. So we can calculate the gradient in that. Call that K max and the x values for our gradient 
the, the line we're measuring the gradient from didn't change, so we can keep that as 12 minus 1. This comes to zero point two six. And similarly, we can find the gradient of the line of minimum gradient. And that goes from it's about zero point three five up to two point four five. That came in. That comes to zero point one nine. So if we take the range here, the range is 0 0.07 and we can say that the error is half the range. So half the range half of 0 0.07, well let's round that up to 0 0.04 so let's say the uncertainty is 0 0.04 centimeters squared And the unit for the constant k, well, we've already added that to our answer, it is centimetres squared. Now, we have motion in a magnetic field, an electron passing through a magnetic field. Now, first we have to accelerate the electron. And the electron is accelerated through a potential difference of 250 volts. So that will give us the energy, the kinetic energy of the electron gained from the from its potential difference, and from that we can calculate the speed. So the equation is going to be kinetic energy half mv squared is equal to the energy gained, which is the charge on the electron, times the accelerating voltage. And we can rearrange that. So v is going to be square root of two eV over the mass of the electron. And the numbers here, E is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, 250 volts. And the mass of the electron from the data booklet is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. All of that square rooted. If I work it out, the answer is 9.4 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. And then we want to find the radius of the path. So once the electron has been accelerated, it's then traveling at constant speed in the magnetic field. And the magnetic field is causing it to move in a circular path. So there must be a centripetal force causing it to move in a circle. And we know that centripetal force is always given by mv squared over r. And in this situation, it's the magnetic force on a moving charge that's making it move in a circle. So the equation for the magnetic force on a moving charge is BQ. Well, that's to be consistent. Let's use E for the charge, V. Now, we want to find the radius of the path, so we can rearrange this. First, one of the Vs cancels with this V. So we can write R equals mv over B, E. Mass of the electron, again, is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. Speed, we've just calculated, 9.4 times 10 to the 6. Divided by, well, Gwatton tells us the magnetic field strength is 0 0.12 Tesla. And again, the charge on the electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So we work that out, and it comes to 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4 meters.
Now we wanted to show. We want to look at this diagram showing the momentum vectors of the electron. So initially the electron is moving forwards, and when it leaves the magnetic field, it's moving towards the right. And we want to draw an arrow to indicate the change in momentum of the electron. Now, the change in momentum. Let's write a vector equation here. The change in momentum. In fact, the change in anything ever is the final thing we have minus the initial thing we have. It's just the definition of change. Uh, so in terms of vectors, we can write this as the initial momentum vector plus minus the initial momentum vector. And this now makes it easy to work out how to draw the change in momentum vector because the final momentum vector, well it's drawn here, and minus the initial momentum vector is just the initial momentum vector reversed, so that's in this direction. So we want to draw the vector that represents the sum of this vector plus this vector. And because these two vectors are head to tail, well the sum of the two is just the single vector that goes from the first tail the final head. So this diagonal line here is the change in momentum. And then having drawn this, well we know that the the initial momentum and the final momentum are both 8.6 times 10 to the minus 24. This side of the triangle and this side of the triangle are both 8.6 times 10 to the minus 24. So the change in momentum is the length of the hypotenuse of this triangle. So we can just use Pythagoras to work that out. It's going to be simply the square root of 8.6 times 10 to the 24 squared plus the same thing squared again. I'm sure I could just write times 2. And that will be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 23 Newton seconds. Now, if the electron spends this time in the magnetic field, we can use that to estimate the force on the electron because we know the relationship between force and rate of change of momentum, that's Newton's second law, F equals delta P over delta T. And the change in momentum of the electron is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 23. Divided by the time, the uh, time is 7.5 times 10 to the 11 and that comes to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13. The units are Newtons. Um, however, this is an estimate. Why is it an estimate? Well, the force is not acting in, a, in the same direction all the time. The direction of the force changes as the direction of the charge changes. So this would only be true if it were a force with a constant direction. Next we have another question about circular motion. Now we want to show the forces on a ball that's travelling in a horizontal circle. So there are two forces on the ball. Oops. The ball has a weight acting downwards. Let's label that mg. And there must be a tension in the string. Let's draw that upwards along the string, and let's call that 
T. Let's give these words because the question is asking us to label. So let's call that tension and let's, let's call this one the weight. By the way, this is not gravity. Gravity is not a force. Gravity is a phenomenon. The force due to gravity is called, always called the weight. And now we have the forces labelled, we can explain whether the ball is at in equilibrium. Well, looking at the two forces, they're not in opposite directions, so there's no way they can balance. So the simple answer would be no, because they cannot balance. And that's pretty much what the mark scheme answer is. Although, it's also acceptable to say, well, the ball's moving in a circle, and if it's moving in a circle, the direction is constantly changing. So its velocity is changing, so there must be a force to cause that velocity change. And how do we find the speed of rotation of the ball? Well, what do we know about circular motion? Again, we know that F equals mb squared over R, that's means moving in a circle. And that force must be given by the component of the tension that's acting horizontally. Because if we go back to the diagram, we can actually split the tension into two, per two perpendicular components. One, two. And the values of these, or well, the horizontal component, is going to be T times sine 30, because it's on the opposite side of this triangle where 30 is the angle, and the upwards component is going to be T cosine 30. And T sine 30 is going to give us the centripetal acceleration. We can also say that T cosine 30 must balance the weight because there's no vertical acceleration. So, we don't know the tension, so we need to eliminate the t from this equation. And we could do that by substituting in from here, t equals t equals mg over cosine 30. So that gives us mv squared over r equals mg sine 30 over cosine 30. And we can also recognise that sine over cosine is tan, so that's mg tan. 30. So to determine the speed, just make V the substitute. So V is going to be equal to, I have to cancel the M's, V is going to be equal to G R 10 30 square rooted. Put the numbers in. G is 9.81. R, the radius of the circle, it tells us is 0 0.33 meters. And tan 30, well, we can find that in our calculator. And we work it out, and the speed is. One point three six meters per second. Well, strictly speaking, should be given to two decimal places because all of our data is to two decimal places. So maybe let's rewrite that as one point four meters per second. What's this one? 